Before church, brother, before church. We're going to teach him. Amen. Somebody say amen. Spirit of excellence. Somebody say amen. Spirit of excellence. Ooh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Rejoicing. Thank you. Thank you tonight. I'm going to have you. I'm going to go ahead and minister. Appreciate you. Great worship tonight. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate you all coming last time. And I was thrilled to hear that they were coming back. Amen? I forgot where you're from, but I'm glad you're here. I don't care where you're from. I'm glad you're here. We're in the now. Amen? We're in here. Amen. Appreciate all of you tonight. We want to go ahead and get in the words so we can flow. I'm going to ask the worship team tonight, as soon as I finish preaching, if you don't mind to come back, just be ready. Worship leader, have your songs ready. And the reason is what I'm going to preach tonight. You'll understand why I ask that. Um, I want to get into something real serious good tonight but it's such a necessity everywhere you go but necessity for this church visiting churches it fits everyone but the thing about what we're going to preach tonight you won't go any further until you correct this you're stuck you're not going any further ever. There's no doubt in my mind. A thousand percent, one hundred percent. You're not going anywhere as a church if you don't you don't correct and do what we're going to preach tonight. And I'm going to make it alive for you. I'm going to make it real. I want you to open up to First Thessalonians chapter five. Everyone looking, verse sixteen. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse sixteen. Look at it with me. Paul again dips his pen in ink and writes a letter to the church at Thessalonica. In the fifth chapter, it's, it's, it's so serious what I just said. It's a must. He begins to minister about this, and in the letter, he's writing, remember, not to a Catholic church. He's writing to a spirit-filled church. The New Testament is spirit-filled writers dipping their pen in ink, writing letters to spirit-filled churches. The recipients and those writing the letters believed in raising the dead, shaking snakes in the fire, okay, when they were struck. They believed in the supernatural, all nine manifestations of the Spirit, not just two, tongues and interpretation, tongues and interpretation. Next service, tongues and interpretation. If you go to the majority of Spirit-filled, charismatic Pentecost churches today and don't read a Bible, you will think that there's two gifts of the Spirit instead of nine. Many a times it's not just the church's fault, it's the leader's fault. Because I'm telling you, we can be ignorant. And I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning spiritual things. He's not just talking about the sin issue right there. He's talking about spiritual things. Let me say this before we go any further. You can be anointed without being weird. But our people have got to stop throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Weird runs people off. I'm wide open. My reputation around America is to be wide open, flexing my wineskin, but never being gullible. But here's the deal. I've observed over all the years in evangelism, 38, four decades of full-time evangelism, pulpit or pew, weird runs people off. Here's how I know weird is not of God. Signs and wonders follow the believer. They're for the unbeliever. The word teaches signs and wonders. As long as I look over, you don't have to chase them. You see people, even traveling preachers, listen. 
out of all, you'd say, professions or callings or whatever, sometimes the traveling preachers are the weirdest. And I'm a traveling preacher. Don't laugh. I'm talking about them, not me. Don't you say nothing. Steve, don't you say nothing. Traveling preachers, because they get to come in and leave. So they burn a lot of pastors and burn a lot of people. And that's where a lot of guys said, I'm done. They shouldn't have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And I tell those pastors, you're wrong for doing that. Find the ones you can trust. There is fivefold, not one. And God has set in the church pastors. No, he didn't say that. He set in the church fivefold, and you know them. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. And all of them are different. The quarterbacks differ from the center. But the quarterback, he's Hall of Famer, but he's got to have a center to center the ball. If you take a quarterback and put him at right guard, he'll look mentally handicapped. He's a Hall of Famer. If you take Peyton Manning, if you take John Elway, if you take whoever, Roger Staubach, Johnny United, the old and the new, if you take Tom Brady, here's his position. He's right here. He's going in the Hall of Fame. If you move him to running back, they'll kill him. If you, may, if you move him to wide receiver, he can't get open. He can't catch it when they throw it to him with anybody on him. Stay with me. If you put him at tackle, they'll demolish him the first play. They'll carry him off. He's never hurt at quarterback. It's the thing about Brady at 44 years old. He's never hurt. I told my wife, it's not just he wins Super Bowls the first year when he gets there and rallies people. I'm telling you one of the greatest things of all time about him. Yeah, he is. You know what I believe? He never gets hurt. How can you be six foot four, thin, and you never get hurt? You stay in your position and you learn it. You learn to, how fast to release the ball. It's more to it than throwing it, man, and just thinking with that brain he's got. He don't get hurt. That's in all the years. It's unbelievable. Especially, I believe he'll play to 50. I believe he'll be playing close to 50 years old because he knows in his brain how to stay in his position, how to release it, get rid of it before they get to him. Listen, you got to stay in your position. Apostle, pastor, prophet, evangelist, teacher. In 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 5, he writes to the Spirit-filled church, 16th verse, he says, rejoice evermore. Raise your hand if you think we ought to rejoice evermore. I don't have a problem with rejoicing evermore. The Baptists don't have problems with rejoicing evermore. If you, if you read this to any denomination, they'd all go, amen. Watch this. Pray without ceasing. Every denomination, amen, brother. We believe in that one too. You ready? Wow. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. How many of y'all believe in giving thanks? You'll always give thanks, not just at the meal. Give thanks. All, everybody believes that. Here's where the division is and sword is drawn. Quench not the spirit. That one verse, verse 19, quench not the spirit. People got problems with it. They don't understand it. They don't understand it. For you to quench not the Spirit, you got to know what it is to quench the Spirit. If you don't know what it is, I'm telling you, it's a trivia question. Many pulpits and pews cannot answer. That's why we go through the routine, same thing over. Now, you ready? Come in. Certain time we start. Song worship goes up. Think about it. We're talking about the Catholics and Lutherans, man, because they light candles or they cross their heart or something with their hand. We have our rituals too. We just do them a little bit louder. And because we turn up the volume, we think, oh, no, it's not a ritual. We think quite is rituals, quite. I'm telling you, you can be loud, hurting people's ears and being a ritual. We worship, what we do? We take the offering, we pastor, evangelist gets up, then we have our altar. You know what we do in doing that all, all the time? We quench the spirit because that's the routine we think it should be. This is why people aren't seeing. I've told them for 42 years of salvation. And remember, I wasn't raised in this. I was Missouri Synod Lutheran, United Methodist daddy, German Lutheran mother, got together, married, conceived, and had a Pentecost preacher. 
Go figure that one. Ask Siri about that. Siri will say, I do not understand the question. I do not. She can't answer you. Abstain, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We, no problem with that. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Hey, believers, everybody knows to get away from evil. Abstain from the appearance of evil. He goes on. We could read it on, but I want to preach. I want to deal with that verse 19 tonight. 19th verse. To quench not the Spirit of God. We have got to get out of our routines. We've got to understand what it's all about. I want all the leadership to hear this tonight. I want the worship teams to listen to this tonight. I want us to fully understand what it is to quench the Spirit and how we quench not the Spirit of God. Another scripture says, grieve not the Spirit of God. So there is a difference in quenching and there is a difference in grieving the Spirit of God. I believe the Word teaches that we grieve Him by, in other words, habitual things in our life that He's dealing with us about. We've got some things we've allowed to move in and we don't do anything to repent this morning's message and to get them out. You can begin to grieve the Spirit of God. When we allow people to come in, uh, I'm going I'm to say example, uh, two homosexual men, we're seeing it now in the churches, with the LGBTQ and everything going on as I travel. I didn't see this in the 80s at all. People dealt with it. When two men came in with their adopted kids with their arms around each other in the church, okay, we gave them a few services. I'm for that. I'm for them coming to repent and get changed. But my deal is I'm going to churches today with two lesbian lovers, uh, yeah, with their adopted children, two homosexual men, and they've been there for a year and a half. Now watch this. They've been there for a year and a half, and I'm not picking, I'm preaching. They still have their arms around one another. It's confusing our heterosexual children that hear it at school all the time. Curriculum, Ellen, they turn on Ellen. Mama loves Ellen. Mama thinks Ellen DeGeneres is cool. Listen to me. They love, Mama loves Oprah Winfrey, used to, New Age. She loves Ellen, the secular humanist televangelist for lesbianism. So our kids from school, now they're even seeing uh, denominations ordaining gay preachers, gay preachers, gay pastors with their same-sex lover sitting on the front as he or she gets up to preach. I'm telling you, our kids are being bombarded because, and all they hear is LGBTQ, LGBTQ, watch it, rainbow, everything. They're bombarded. And this is allowed many times to go on in the spirit-filled churches is where we've gotten to now. I never thought in the 80s I'd have to preach this. They're confused. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even have to mention it. When I get up and preach, these couples that are there, without mentioning the sin of it, the perversion of it, I preach and they either get saved or they don't come back while I'm there. One message, without me mentioning it, they're forced something in the spirit and the word. They're forced to make a decision. My question is to the pastor, why have they been here a year and a half still coming with every service with arms around each other? What, what are you not preaching? What are you quenching, Pastor? I'm not blowing my horn. I'm telling you, nearly every week I see that it takes me one service. And I see them. I know what's going on. I know what's going on. I'm not picking. It's about salvation. It's about redemption. It's about true repentance. What I'm giving them is the only hope they got. What is it? We can grieve the Spirit of God. Example. I use this as an example. We began to grieve in the atmosphere, the Spirit of God, because of its allowance, time after time after time. Not, not giving them, I'm talking about giving them mercy, but, but listen to me what I'm saying. When I began an evangelism out of the Lutheran church into spirit-filled evangelism, I noticed right off the bat how tongues were prevalent. 
Ever churches I began to travel the 48 weeks a year, sometimes two places a week, some of the weeks. I noticed how it bothered me as a Lutheran coming in that I read about all nine tongues and interpretation. Many times the same ones giving the same tongues and interpretation over and over again. And people saying, man, the spirit moved today. The same guy, old man or old woman, getting out in the aisle and doing a little jig and dancing. And spirit, man, the spirit, man, was moving today. And I'm sitting there and the sick are leaving sick. And the blind are still blind and the deaf are still deaf. And it's, it's not much conviction in the atmosphere. The fear of the Lord is not felt ever like a blanket that falls on the church. And the church begins to raise an entire generation of young people that know nothing about the awesome fear of the Lord, meaning the reverence of God. And we wonder why the carnality is running rampant and it's taken over the spirituality. We're wondering where the real divine, you sung about it, brother, where the real miracles are. I'm not, listen, I'm talking about changing miracles. I'm talking about you see them with your eye because you're a believer. And I look over my shoulder and they're following me everywhere I go. See, people should never have to chase the only ones in our churches that chase miracles are, why do you chase it if all you got to do is look over your shoulder and have them following you? You walk as a believer, not a preacher, a believer. If I have anything that follows me, it's not because I've got a mic standing up here in a light with a podium preaching. It's because I'm a believer and they're following me. But while they're following me, I must not quench the spirit and understanding that they are for the unbeliever. You see, these signs shall follow. What's a sign? S-I-G-N-L. -A. a sign. A sign is something you see with your eye. A believer can see a stop sign just like an unbeliever. It don't matter if you're a believer or unbeliever when you're driving a car and you come to a red uh, a, a stop sign. A believer can see it like an unbeliever. An unbeliever sees stop. A believer sees stop. That's a type of signs and wonders, but they got to follow the believer. But they're for him. Because when an unbeliever sees a sign and wonder with their eye, because the church is not quenching the Spirit of God any longer, and the freedom and where the Spirit of the Lord is, a definite, a definite mark, a definite sign, where the real, not good singing, not even good preaching, where the Spirit of the Lord is, and I mean moving, there will always be a freedom and a liberty. Pastor, you talked about in the atmosphere, and, and the whole deal is, if you've ever been in on it, a consistency, a consistency. I told a group, at a, they had a camp meeting a while back with great preachers. I told them, I said, but camp meeting's not revival. I said, I'm telling you now, we got to understand this. Camp meeting, having a series of services, is not what I'm talking about, and it kind of got on some of them. Like, I said, see, you don't know what revival is. And as a true evangelist, many preachers even, uh, they'll call something revival. And I'll say it's not revival. It's just two. you had two or three good church services in a row. Almost all of our friends are this way. They have two good church. They're not used to it. They're not used to having two explosive church services in a row. So they man, we're in revival. And I go, man, I'm not trying to be negative, but I don't want you to be deceived in what real revival is all about. You see, and it's more than this, but let me touch it. In the original Greek text, the, the number nine is correct in Corinthians. The word gift is not correct. I wish, this is not sacrilegious what I'm going to say. I wish the old English writers, the old English writers that wrote, what, 1700 and something? What, what, when was the first tr King James written? I forgot. 15-something, seven, what, no matter. But the old English writers, when they wrote, they used the wrong term according to our word, according to our culture. They used the word nine gifts, G-I-F-T-S. They're not gifts. In the original translation, they're manifestations. Now I'm starting to see something. Brother, a tiny bit of microphone please. There are nine manifestations of the Spirit. Thank you. Broken down into three categories of three. The reason 
I don't want you to view them like we have. That's where people have gotten off and they quench the spirit because they view them as birthday and Christmas gifts. They view the nine manifestation because we think gift, God gives a gift like I give birthday, anniversary, friendship, Christmas gift. I pass out the gift. I'm the one that's got it, so I pass the gift out. I don't sit there and look over it and see what you're doing with it. That'd be rude. It's the thought that counts. You give the gift, you turn your back. Hey, man, thank you. And you walk away. You walk away. But see, God doesn't do that. Now, here's where it comes in. The term, he giveth them severally as he will. Now, if I look at them as manifestations, three verbal, tongues, three categories of three, three verbal, tongues, tongues, interpretation of the tongues. You said a while ago, prophecy. Prophesying the word of the Lord. That word prophesying, many places in, in the New Testament is preaching under the anointing of God. Not just getting up because it's your turn to preach and or your job and just saying something. It's not just, yea, I say unto thee. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning spiritual things. Prophesying is not just, yea, I say unto thee, I say unto you, I am coming that the Lord is about. So you can get up. Here's how we're ignorant in this way. You can get up and say, yay. You put a yay, I say unto thee before it. People cause it prophesying. You can get up in the pulpit like I'm doing tonight, come forth with powerful word. People call it preaching. But now if I got up before I started tonight and said, close my eyes and formed a, a, a different type of mannerism and said, yay, I say unto thee, and said all this that I'm saying right now, people would go, my God, you hear that prophesying. We're ignorant in certain areas. When the Bible said in the last days, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon them and they will prophesy. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Your sons and your daughters, Scripture there, women and men. Last time I checked, daughters were women. And handmaidens, I pour my spirit. Guys, that was women. A handmaiden and a woman, a, a, a daughter is a woman. They shall prophesy. Women, here's your Scriptures. To back up, a woman can preach the Word. Because that word prophesying there is not yea, I say unto thee. It's proclaiming with a powerful anointing the living word of God that the worlds were framed by. See, I'm not preaching just out of a Bible. I'm preaching out of the word, the actual word that framed the worlds, that literally framed the planet, caused the earth to spin. That eternal word that told it to spin and it told it, you will not stop spinning, causing gravity, until I speak again to you, if I do, I will tell you when I do. You'll feel the power of the spoken word. It's the same word that someone on the unction, the anointing, begins to preach with. Listen to me. So we will prophesy the word of the Lord. Three verbal. Three verbal. Tongues, interpretation, prophesy. That manifestation, whether the word, the Bible was open or not. But many times, yes, the Bible is open. Prophesying. Preaching the uncompromising word of God that changes lives. Then we have the three, what? Revelatory. Revelatory. <clears throat> word of wisdom. Word of knowledge. And what? Discerning of spirits. And let me say it again. That important you get this tonight. In the phrase, in the subject of not quenching the spirit. It's important you get this tonight. <clears throat> That discerning of spirits is not just demons, though it is that too. It's discerning the spirits of men. Not just when you're in a church service. Not just to preach your preaching and then in the altar looking at people and feeling something out. Please listen to me. It's not a ritual. It's not a form. It works in Walmart, I'll 10, like it does a Pentecostal church service. It works when you're getting on a plane. It operates when you're getting off the plane. It operates when God gives you something for your best friend and you're not worried about losing the friendship because you're going to give it to he or her exactly like the Spirit of the Lord has prompted you. And there will be a punch behind it, a thrust. There will be a sign and a wonder that there's no doubt about it. Without rationalization, we have seen the gift of rationalization that literally has come into our churches and it's taken the place of the specifics. 
rationalization is substituted for the specific manifestation of the verbal word of wisdom, or revelatory word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. I tell people, you better know who's preaching to you in the last days. Because when that rapture of the church takes place, around the world, when that rapture of the church takes place, and the backslidden Pentecost church is left behind, they'll one day stand in a line of the Antichrist with maybe his hands all over them. He will become their pastor in the tribulation period because they had no discernment before or after the rapture to understand who he is and exactly what's going on. What's the difference in word of wisdom, word of knowledge? Watch this. The difference in word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Two out of the three revelatory manifestations is simply this. Knowledge, it takes knowledge to take something apart. It takes wisdom to put it back together. If I gave all of you a screwdriver, Phillips head and flathead, told you in an old car out here, the old car, there's a carburetor. I took you the carburetor and showed you the screws that were in it. You women and men could look up Phillips head, uh, uh, flathead. You know the difference when you look at the screw. You got knowledge. Any of you could put that in that, in that screw. You could, un, you could turn it a certain way. You got knowledge to take the carburetor off and apart. It takes the wisdom of a mechanic to put it back together so the car will start and run. Knowledge, when you operate in it, can dissect and take people, things apart in their life. Before many times you can put it back together, you've got to take it apart. So it's called diagnosing, and then it's called the remedy. The word of knowledge, the manifestation of, 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 of wisdom, literally puts things back together. We've got the three revelatory. Then also we have the three power. The gift of faith is translated manifestation of faith. The gift of healing is the manifestation of miracles and healings. Then we have the working, watch that, the working of miracles. The working of miracles is the manifestation of miracles. Don't need to be healed. Part is taken out of a body and the person wants that part back. Cancer hits a young woman, 20 years old, 25 Cancer hits her womb. It's so spread out and so vicious. The doctor goes in and removes the womb of the 22-year-old girl. Now she's 30 and she's tired of going to everybody else's baby shower. She's tired. She wants, her ch wants a child. But medically, it's impossible for her to have a child. unless. But the womb's been taken away. That's not healing. She don't need healing. She was healed by the surgeon's scalpel as far as removing the danger of the cancer. Now she needs the manifestation of the working of a miracle. She needs God to put that womb, a fresh womb, back in her body. And it happens a lot where they believe in the quenching not the Spirit of God. Listen to me. This is what I'm talking about. Healing the cancer, taking it out. In the original womb, now the working and the manifestation of miracles to put the surgically removed womb a different one back in the body. Hear how I word that. We've got to understand their manifestations. They are severally as He will. I go to some services, churches, they need this one. They need the three verbal. I go the next week, they don't need the three verbal near as they much the three power, the healings and the miracles. I go one week, man, discerning of spirits is needed so bad. Church is full of demons full of devils. What type of demon has bound up that church? Not being weird, man. What type of demon? It's either real or it isn't. I go the next week, the manifestation of whatever is needed. So that's when severally, severally as He will, He moves in the manifestations, the nine manifestations, because the three categories of three <laughs> can definitely get the job done. Now, what are we seeing? I went to a popular mega church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'm not going to mention where. Tracy and I went over one night, a very popular television preacher that everybody likes, I, be, I believe, in here. He was real. He's real. He was, he was preaching. 
The whole time the large red numbers were in the back on a countdown. The numbers are about this big. They're that wide. They're right under the TV camera. And the preachers were nervous wrecks by looking. I saw them. I'm a preacher. I know what they were doing. In this huge opening first of the year, first fruits outpouring, they called it. The majority of the mega churches that are supposed to be spirit filled in the United States, just the way it is, it's bothered me. Their services, everything from the start to the walking out, even at night, their services go 57 minutes to 62. You can check out the red numbers. They grow this away. 57 minutes, they do get out before the Baptists. They really do. They brag on it. They really do. That isn't a cliche. They beat the Baptists Sunday to the restaurants. They kid about it. Watch it. And we laugh because you're right. But yet really, it's not a joke. Think about it. It's really not a joke. The music is studio musicians. Guys, you can't get him better. The preacher really isn't a preacher. He's a teacher. Often wondered why is the majority of the mega churches, spirit filled supposedly, in the United States, why are they not preachers? The majority of them, border to border, are teachers. They don't preach and get on to anything. You better stay with me in this. It's what I do. I observe. Preachers like you, our friends, man, if I could have a building right now, Robbie, if I could get my hands on it, watch it, certain building. If I could get a certain type of music in here, watch it, watch it. If we could get more money, man, if I had more, whoo, them churches taking millions. If I had a million dollars in the bank, you know what I noticed about the majority of the mega churches in America? Well, well, they wasn't around in the 80s. When I started evangelizing in 1983 at 22 years old, you know the largest church in America, Pentecost, Spirit-filled, Charismatic and all, during the Charismatic Renewal, when all the Lutherans and Baptists and Catholics were getting filled, coming out of our denominations from lighting candles and wearing the robes, and Baptist preachers were coming in the Holy Ghost. A large spirit-filled church was 500. That was huge. All the evangelists wanted to go to the 300 churches. I was in them. Ran three, four, five hundred. Man, you had arrived. That was the big spirit-filled churches. The largest one in America, two of them, was New Orleans First Assembly of God, Pastor Marvin Gorman, and Baton Rouge, Jimmy Swagger, right up the road. They had 7,000 each. 7,000 each. That was really the first mega churches. And then they began to spread. But here's what I want you to see. They've got everything that pastors think they need to have revival. They've got the studio musicians. They've got the building. Everything's a spirit of excellence. You ready? But why is it not one of them ever break out in a dynamic move of God? I'm just asking, why is it that you never hear one of our mega churches break out in miracles, break out, watch it, in dynamic moves of God that everybody's coming to? The Pensacola revival wasn't a mega church. They ran under Brunt John Kilpatrick, 700, 8. They wasn't the thousands. Lynn Cooley came in. Steve Hill came in. You know what had happened? Brother, Brother Kilpatrick's mother or father, I can't remember what, which one it was, had died. He was low in his spirit. Steve Hill was a missionary. They didn't even have it on the calendar. The Pensacola revival, that's why I love it, wasn't even on the calendar. It wasn't like you and I do when I call and we put something together and I'm coming. Steve Hill came through as a missionary. And he said, hey, Brother Kilpatrick, I'm in town. I'm sorry to hear about your mother or father's passing. I know your spirit. You loved them so much. I'm just, while I'm here, do you, do you need me to preach for you? He said, Steve, I'd love for you to preach for me. 
And he came that Sunday morning and the river of God hit, not because Steve was in town. The river of God hit and Brother Kilpatrick was standing in the altar. That's where they got the river songs and the river of God. His legs this way began to literally bend like he was standing in a current of water. Knee deep river. And it began to flee. He just felt it. He went, my God, what is taking place? He looked down, nobody around him, and his legs were starting to move like this, and he felt to fight it. It was a manifestation, and the first full manifestation that he felt when he raised his hand with the microphone, standing in the altar Sunday morning, and he said, folks, the river is here. It is, he has finally, meaning the move of the Spirit, he has finally come. Now I want you all to hear this, and it's a key. American pastors, listen. American churches, listen. Listen to the evangelist that observes. I observe. I just don't read the Bible all the time. I observe everything going on. I try my best to let it be a teacher to me. Why is it that the mega churches whew, never see an outbreak in their cities of explosive, dynamic, book of Acts, signs and wonders? Are y'all ready? They've timed him out of the services. You ever heard of timeout? Stopwatch? Got red numbers under the camera. You will go by those or you're out. You're never asked to come again. No matter what you feel, no matter the prompting you feel, you will go by those numbers. Their services go from 57 to 62 minutes. And the 62... That is the opening, that's the music, that's offerings, that's a preaching, that's their altar service, holding of hands, joining fingertips, many of them. As their group comes down, I've watched them, they walk down, the people need it, they grab fingertips. I'm not picking, I'm preaching. Listen to me, I'm, I'm giving you my point. They hold fingertips. And they hold hands like this, scared of lawsuits or whatever. And they go. Ushers will come back. Thank you. Do you feel your touch? Okay. They never have an outbreak of the Spirit. And all of our small, medium, and semi, it's kind of like t-shirts, small, medium, large, XL, and mega, mega, mega. Okay. The other groups on the t-shirts, small, medium, and large, need to understand something. You can time him out. What has happened? They have quenched. I've been telling the preachers this. Some of the mega pastors, you're quenching the spirit, brother. I'm telling you, listen, you're quenching the spirit. When I started in evangelism years ago, to the American culture, the Lord told me at 22, tell them, you will have a starting time. You will not have an ending time. They can go anytime they need to go. We're not going to grab you and have ushers tackle you and not let you get to your car. If you need to go to work, go to, you got to go to work. We understand that. But I'm telling you, in leadership, our mindset, many of our churches, the mega pastors, the staff, listen. As soon as it starts, all they do is watch the watch or the clock. As soon as it starts, before it even starts, they're planning their ending. Before it even starts, the countdown on the screen to hit the first note in perfect timing when it goes from one second to zero. I'm for all that excellence, yeah. But they plan their ending before they even start. So they're so engulfed by a watch and a clock. I'm giving an example. They can't be sensitive to the moving of God in the direction that He's taken them. That preacher was a nervous wreck. I watch him on TV preach. I'm gonna be honest. It was Jensen Franklin. I watch him on TV preach when he's at his church or whatever, and it's good. But all of a sudden, he's in this other church. He's not the same. I leaned over to my wife. I said, do you see what it's done? They put him on such a time schedule. He's just rushing through everything he says to where a good preacher don't even sound like a great preacher. He seems fair. He sounds fair because the leadership has rushed him so much and rushed him until his sentences, he don't even get to finish them by he's looking at his notes and going into something else. Don't miss what I'm about to give you. 
If you invite someone to come to your house, if I invited this couple, Pastor Ash and his family, come to my house, they visited Tracy and I in DFW. Let's just say they got there at 6.30 Monday night, the time of our service tomorrow night if the Lord tarries. 6.30, they come in. Man, we're grabbing 6.30. We're hugging. How y'all doing? Uh, yeah. 7 o'clock rolls around 30 minutes. We're still talking. It's around 7.20, 20, 25. Tracy and I, about an hour, we get real fidgety. And I turn to Steve and I go, hey, ma'am, our refrigerator's your refrigerator. Y'all go after it. Remotes on the counter, whatever. I said, there's a, there's a movie that Tracy and I have been wanting to go to. Steve, if y'all don't mind, 7.30, it's been an hour. We're going to run out of here to a movie. Y'all just make yourself home. You know what that is? It's rude. You know why? I invited you to come to my house. When you invite someone to come, you let them leave first. You don't walk out on them. You let your visitor, you invited them. You let them say what they want to say. You let them talk the majority of the time. It's courteous when you invite someone to come. Come, Holy Spirit, I need... Really? You really need Him? You really want Him? Come, Holy Spirit, I need Thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray all that. But He comes. We time Him out. We leave before He does. We leave before He's finished. Because we got to get to our hamburger. we got to get to our TV program. We got, we got to hurry up to the game that we even DVR'd. We want to hurry and push the button, man. I'm telling you, the American culture, and everybody wants to know what's happened to all the miracles, my brother. Where are they? I'm telling you, we've timed them out. We have cultured him out of the services. We care more about food, man, and what we're watching on TV. Some people can't stay off their phones. Oh, my God. During a Pentecostal church service, can't stay off of them. They're addicted. They got an addiction, man. It's worse than alcohol or equal. But everybody's wanting to know what's going on. The unity, the unison of the service. One's on their phone. Another one's doing this. Another one's doing that. Another one. The unison of the service. The spirit is totally quenched. Through our routine and our time timed him out we have quenched the spirit of God we've grieved the Holy Ghost God told him go to the upper room I often say just a question he told them get to the upper room when I ascend the Holy Ghost will descend think about it I asked one time what if they stopped they were tired stopped 350 yards southwest of the upper room in another building. Would they have been filled? No. He fell in the upper room, geographically where he told him to get to. He is telling all of us to get to a certain place. Why do you think even the word said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together? What? As you see that day approaching, as the manner of some is. Nowadays, it's about half the church or more. Forsake not the assembly. Why? Because if you can get one accord and one mind in a certain geographical atmosphere where you all have gathered. He moves, he will move all the time. But there's something about if we'll quit gathering and quenching the spirit, but if we'll also just gather. The lack of faithfulness is a serious thing with God because as we see the end approaching and that day approaching, he kept talking about that day, that day. As you see that day approaching, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. You watching online tonight, Forsake not the assembling of yourself together. Get in that place. If they'd have stopped 300 yards southwest, northwest, northeast, 10 yards south of it, I'm telling you, they would have not been filled in somebody's house. He told them, here's the instruction. Go to the upper room. Make sure you know where the upper room is. Get in that upper room. Because at the first dissension, and remember, Old Testament, I said this morning, visitation. New Testament's habitation. 
Old Testament, he visited. Task done. Goliath goes down. Samson pushes down the Colosseum uh, pillars. Watch it. When the, when the end of the task was done, visitation. The Spirit of God lifted. Now in the new covenant, he doesn't lift. He doesn't lift. I said this morning, for you that wasn't here, I believe the reason God many times we're all around people hollering in their ear, got them in headlocks and everything else. The reason we're praying, begging for the baptism. I believe many times God don't fill them on Sunday because he knows he's going to have to visit and move out on Tuesday. He's looking for people that are serious. He's looking for an upper room experience that's serious during the covenant of habitation. He ain't going to fill you Sunday if you're going to grieve him away. Quench him, quench him, grieve him, quench him, grieve him. He's got to move out on Thursday. He, I hate moving. Let me tell you something. You know what I hate as much as the devil? Not you. I hate moving. And I'm going to tell you, when I'm moving from one house to another, I hate it more than the devil. I'll be honest with you. I hate moving more than the devil. But when I get through moving, I hate the devil again more than moving. <laughs> but while I'm moving, I hate the stinking. I hate it. I hate every fruit jar and everything else. Every nut and bolts, you got to wife said, get that nose nut and bolts, you got to sweep out. I ain't sweeping no nut and bolts. Let the person moving in here. I'm going to leave them some nut and bolts. I'm going to leave them some stuff. Leave them them nut and bolts. I don't want to pick up every stinking nut and bolt and washer. Trey said, get them washers. I ain't getting them washers. They might need them. I want to be Christian, Christ-like. I might leave them something. I want to give unto them. Let's leave them those fruit jars, Tracy. Let's leave them this. Let's leave them that. Let's leave them those shoestrings from old shoes. They might be poor after they bought our house and they need shoestrings. I don't want their kids going to school without shoestrings and have old flappy shoes. Are y'all hearing me? It's the love of God in me. It's Christ-like. I don't care what you say. You're wrong. That's good, brother, right there. That's, I'm going to write that down. I mean, I mean, you, you, y'all think about something. Now, seriously. Now, here I go. All right, I'm not, don't, don't worry, Steve, Pastor. Don't worry when I bring this up. I'm using wisdom. I'm not going to offend anybody on this. I, I know both sides. We were talking today about vaccine. So here we go. He's a nervous wreck right now. Here we go about the vaccine. I got preacher friends that are dynamic. They're rocking the town. As soon as that vaccine came out, they ran up and got it. And they're 30 years old. I got preacher friends that are dynamic. They ain't taking no vaccine. They ain't putting that in their body. They don't know what it is. Like me. I've never had a flu shot ever had polio shot because they gave it to me when I was in school. They didn't even ask my parents. You had the little deal in the arm, polio. Back then, when I, 1960 something. You went home and told your parents they sent something, you'd been vaccinated with a polio vaccine. Parents just went, oh, good, good, glad you got it. It's free, it's the school system. <laughs> little mark, then it moves around, remember, and then it went away. So I go places. In the Pentecost church, all this division we got. I mean, look how the, I know it's a demon. Look how the devil raised it up again. Critical race theory, black, white, black, white. I'm from the South, man. Black, white. I'm from Arkansas, wife's from Alabama, and we live in DFW now. That's Southern. Come on, Oklahoma, that's Southern. That ain't West, that's South. Arkansas and Alabama is more south than Texas. That's south. That's a southern, southeastern conference, okay? That's southern boys and girls. He raises the black and white issue. I was raised in the Martin Luther King days. I remember where I was when the white dude shot Martin Luther King and the panic on my white mama's face when she screamed for me in the neighborhood because I said, what are you doing? Robbie, Robbie, get off your bike, get up here. I said, why? She said, because the blacks are right over in Northwest Avenue in South Arkansas. He shot Memphis. They're going down the street rioting. They're throwing bricks through all the windows. And I remember my family that loved black people, went to school, with athletics with them, track and field, whatever. 
My mother was the only white woman in a station wagon that would take the South Arkansas black and Eldorado Arkansas black kids and let them ride with us when the other white parents wouldn't let them ride. They had to fumigate their car when the black, beautiful little black innocent kids got out. They would say to my mom, God, Elaine, dear Lord, a blankety blank, Elaine, cussing. You let all them little in in your car? I remember it as a little blonde-headed, blue-eyed white boy sitting there listening, confused. I remember my dad that loved black people, but they didn't know us. Some of them didn't know us. And the riots were going on. They were going crazy all over at a gunshot in Memphis. My dad with his, we were squirrel hunters, 12-gauge shotguns. And my dad said, Elaine, like a tornado drill. My dad said, Elaine, my mother's name, get Robbie in the hall. Like a tornado drill. And I got in the hall away from all the windows. And my dad had went to a, 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 a pawn shop that was closing down. And the, the price of uh, six shotgun shells, number six, for squirrels was on sale. And he bought boxes, the square boxes of shotguns. And I can see them now. And I was saying, why are you doing that, Dad? As he went through shotgun shells, he took them out of the box and he put them in different places in the house so he didn't have to mess around fondling through trying to get shells out of a tight box. He put shells all over the house where he could put them in his 12-gauge pump and shoot if he needed to and reload real quick. I remember it. I was six years old in Eldorado, Arkansas. We didn't have to use it, thank God. Now I see the demons. It's attacking the spirit of the church. This is how I know it's a devil because if it's black and white, it's now an attack in the cities on Asians. Black, white, and Hispanic attacking Asians because we heard that, the and, and I believe, the virus came from Wuhan, China. So they see anybody. Like some of them are South Korean. Some of them are Filipino. They don't even like China. They don't like, they ran from China, their parents. We see the white and the black and the Hispanic beaten, beaten up in New York and different cities. Anybody that their eyes are slanted a little bit. They see the, 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 the eye slanted and the features, and they attack them. Even in the church, some of them look at them like, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, all this. So you got, you got people, d demonic. Oh my God. You don't love anybody because you don't take the vaccine. You don't love anybody. You're not going to take that vaccine. Then I see the other side. In the Spirit-filled church, you took that vaccine? I guess next you'll be standing in line to take the freaking mark of the beast, won't you? It, no, I don't believe it's a mark, but you sure, you just ran your little booty up there. I've heard them tell them. You just ran your little hind end up there and you got that vaccine. Are you gonna run that fast to get the mark of the beast when you can't buy, sell, or trade? You took the vaccine. You're ignorant. You didn't take it. You have no love. You're still wearing a mask. Are you kidding me? You don't have faith. Get some faith, man. Then on the other side, the mask wears. You don't love like the vaccine deal. I don't want you breathing all over me and my kids. And we got this and we got that. And you wear it and you don't wear it. And you take it and you don't take it. I'm standing there like a ping pong match, like a tennis match. I love them all. I'm sitting here going, guys, guys, I just want you all to remember the important stuff. Wear your deodorant to church tonight. I just want you all to wear, both sides, to wear your deodorant in my revivals because a lot of Pentecost people, it gets hot and heavy, they start raising their hands. Please wear your deodorant. I just want to make that statement tomorrow night if you come back. One guy said to me, he said, I'm telling you what's happening right now. I'm telling you what's happening. I said, what? He said, that, that gum Joe Biden, all them Democrats. He said, I'm telling you right now what they're doing. I said, what? He said, they're putting chips in people. That's what they're doing. They're putting chips in people. I said, you mean they're handing out chips? I said, email them. Tell them I want some nacho cheese Doritos. That's what I like. If they're passing out chips, send me. I ain't ever been on welfare, but send me some Doritos. Y'all still with me? He said, I like ranch. You know what? It's all about quenching the spirit. And I'm sitting here. 
I'm just being honest with you. We talked today. If you feel like you got to have it, just study it all and do what you feel. My wife ain't taking no vaccine, I'll tell you now. She ain't taking it. And I hadn't had it. I hadn't had it. I, I'm going to... I'm going to let you be the guinea pig and I'm going to watch you a little bit longer because I love you. You come walking in church and you're doing like Steve does, you know, like this. He ain't had no vaccine. Come in and start doing all this and start doing all that. I'm, I'm not going to say, see, I told you. I'm just going to say, I'll pray for you. I'll quench not the spirit and pray for you. I saw, I saw a cartoon, a meme, cartoon's funny. If you can see it, it's funnier than me telling you, but I'll try to show it in this word. It was two mice, two rats. Did you see it? When the vaccine came out, two rats, experimental rats in a laboratory. One rat was talking to the other one. He said, hey, man, you got that vaccine yet? The other rat said to him, no, man, I'm going to wait and see what it does on those humans first. That's funny right there. That's not pro or anti. That's just funny. That's funny. I mean, I'm sorry that offended you, but that's funny. Um, 24 hours a day, 365 days in a year. That's 8,760 hours in a year. 8,760 hours in a year. If you go to a mega church in the United States of America, 57 minutes, 62, well, average, average it to 60 minutes, one hour. If you go every week, including Christmas, you're there 52 hours in a church service a week. That leaves you 8,708 hours, not in a moving presence of God at all, even if he's allowed to move. Fifty-two hours versus 8,708 hours. And I want our preachers to understand this because many of them don't. There's a difference in the omnipotent presence of God in the Bible and the moving presence. Omnipotent presence is he knows what's going on everywhere. If a hair blows off your stinking head, he can count it. If you get a bottle of Rogaine, grow another one, he can add it back. He's a great mathematician. Subtraction, multiplication, he added to the church daily. Such should be saved. He multiplied the loaves and fishes. He knows everything about a sparrow. Even if a bird hits the ground, he'll tell you what type of bird. Notice in that scripture, he didn't say, I know when a bird hits the ground. I'll tell you when a sparrow hits the ground. A blue jay, a red bird. He's given us specifics. That's omnipresence. David said, if I make my nest among the stars, you're able to bring me down. If I descend into hell, thou art there. Well, the hell of hell, the hell of going to hell, is not the fire. Worse than the fire, that's bad enough, is no presence of God. There's no presence of God there ever. It's void. You with me? There's an omnipresence of God when people say God's here. And there is a moving presence. If he introduced me tonight, y'all know what I'm supposed to do. And I, I turned to the pulpit, I took the pulpit, took the mic, held it up, looked at the pastor, and went like this. And stood for an hour just going. I'm here, but I'm not moving in what I'm supposed to be moving in. Yeah, he knows what's going on everywhere. But in the American, the majority, the majority by far, they don't allow him to move. People have quenched him. The power and agreement when a preacher's preaching. I'm going to challenge Wagner. Visitors, excuse me. I'm going to challenge Wagner right now because I'm here. When a preacher such as Steve Ash, me, whoever, is up preaching the word, there needs to be a pew pulpit agreement. It's something in the atmosphere when people, even if they're white people, did you hear me, white people? 
when white people, no matter personality of culture, whatever, begins to respond instead of staring. This will free up your services because you're not quenching the spirit. You are lit. Yes, I agree. Amen. Preach. Come on, brother. Hallelujah. It's something. Something. Instead of a funeral atmosphere, sitting like you're at a funeral honoring the passing of a relative. Reverence has nothing to do with volume. We've been sold that lie by many leaders and denominations that would not allow any noise in church because it's not reverence. Reverence has nothing to do with volume. Authority has nothing to do with how loud you can get. But there's a time to be loud. And there's time to shut your mouth. There's a time to be still. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to cry. Even in the church service. You can turn a great service into a circus. Wisdom prompting being led by. The manifestations of the Spirit of God are not always a bless me club. We see in the charismatic churches, the charismatic renewal. I'm just be honest. I'm going to call it because I want you to see it. In the charismatic of Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're right by it. All the way straight line to Dallas-Fort Worth where I live. We saw the abuse of many things and I always make the statement, the abusing of the truth by few leads to the refusing of the truth by many. If a few people want to put on a show because of spiritual pride, watch the people it runs off. You can't even count them all. And the sad thing about it, the abuse of the great things of God, only eternity will tell us how many people went to hell and never stepped back in a spirit-filled church. Want nothing to do with it. I was in that circus, brother. I'll never go back. I would never. I'd put my kids in a cult before I take them back. I've heard that a lot of times because of the ignorance or the pride of a leader with a microphone that tried to put on a show. And I make this statement to evangelists and different ones. Be careful to fall into the performance trap. The same devil that tempts a man, woman with anything is the same devil that will tempt you as a leader to fall into the performance trap because you feel like you got to perform or the people won't think you're spiritual. So you began to force instead of flow. You began to force something to happen. Disaster hits. Preachers that flow, believers that flow, never force because they know the flow. Preachers that don't know the flow have to constantly force something to happen. To make themselves look like they're not dead. And that they got something. It's a pride issue. It's a pride that cometh before the fall. Are you with me? I ask the worship leaders, the worship team here and visiting. For all of us. That we're sensitive to the Holy Ghost when we begin the service. That we're in perfect union with a pastor. You don't have to preach every service. It's not sacrilegious not to preach. He might, you might have the altar service first instead of last. He might take over. And then you might preach at the end where the altar service used to be. There might not be offering boxes at the, or passed out, pans or bags passed out some service because the Spirit of God is moving. You don't have to stop. You'll have the greatest offering you've ever had by just letting Him flow and then telling people to give. Coming off that, they'll give. You don't have to say anything about it. We didn't pass it today, just give. Thank you, thank you. My God, just letting him move. He will do different things in different ways. When we operate in the Spirit of God, it will not always be about bless me club. It will not be, I'm very leery of a man or woman with a mic that constantly moves in the altar and everything they tell everybody is a great blessing. Oh, I see you prospering. I see that the money, oh yes, yes, I closed my eyes a while ago and I saw, no, not ones. Brother, I looked at you a while ago and I, oh yeah, ooh, I just saw it right now. Right on top of your pretty black hair. It was green, it was green. Brother, it was $100 bills. I don't know if,
means anything to you. I know you're smiling real big right now. Amen. But I saw $100 bills. Oh, it wasn't on you. I'm sorry. It wasn't on you. It was just $100 bills, and you just buried in $100 bills. Does it mean anything to you, brother? Yeah. I've been needing to find trouble making my car payment last month. Oh, yes. And the church. Oh, glory to God. Oh, oh. I mean, my, I'm serious, man. You know, Lord, let me, let me fake it. Can I fake something a minute? Watch the mannerisms. We're learning tonight. This is a traveling preacher preaching this. A traveling, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, hold on a minute. Whew. Just blow a little bit like a deer, like a buck deer. Whew. Or a doe. Whew. Blow a little bit. Blow a little bit. Cock your head a little bit. Close your eyes. I'm not ignorant, man. They think I'm stupid. These playboy preachers. Oh, they close your eyes. Lean over toward the direction. Whoo. Whoo. Do the woo deal. Y'all know I'm preaching the truth right now, you charismatics. Whoo. Whoo. Hold on, Pastor. Hold on. I'm feeling something. Y'all, I'm not neglecting you. I feel something in this area right now. Whoo. 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 And ushers run up behind me because I'm fixing to fall out. Somebody in this section right here that needs a financial blessing right now. Now, I'm being, I'm being honest now, real. Would you raise your hand if you could use more finances in this section right here? Just raise your hand. It's everybody. We're in America, 2021. And the ones that didn't raise their hand, you just lied. Amen. You lied to the preacher. See, you lied. Scared I was going to put And watch this. You know, quit lying. I'm telling you, quit lying, especially the preacher in church. Because you know where all liars go. Washington, D.C. Amen. You're going to wind up Washington one day. Keep lying. <laughs> oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm, he's moving me. Whoo, whoo, over here. There's somebody in this area through here that has had, uh, past couple days, you've had a headache, a literal headache. I'm just asking, raise your hand if you had a headache within two or three days. Anybody? Wow, buddy. Wow. There's somebody over here in this area. Your kids have talked back to you lately. Raise your hand if your kids have talked back to you lately. You got a little rebellion in your house? Watch the evangelist. Are y'all ready? I'm raising everything I got right now. Are you ready? My grown kids talked back to me yesterday. I told them I was going to kill them right before I got here. I said, I will kill you right now. I will kill you dead. I'm going, where are you going, Dad? I'm going to preach your revival. Let's get back to it. I will kill you right now. If I get my hands on you right now and you're 36 years old, I'm going to kill you. I ain't going to whip your butt. I'm going to kill you. I'm telling you right now what I'm feeling. Don't talk to me like that. Tell me something. I repented. I told the Lord I wouldn't do that. Say that on the way to revival. I'll wait till I get through preaching on the way home. to tell him I'm going to kill him. You see, hey man, I love you. You can play with it. I'm telling you, you can play with it. But when it's real, there's a feeling that follows it. The real manifestations, there's a feeling that follows it. It's unexplainable. It's, a, it's an awesome blessing, fear of the Lord in one package. It's a reverence. It's a woo. Man, it is a woo. And you're like, whoa, man. Woo, I feel that. It's real. I'll close with this tonight. This has happened multiple times over the years, and please listen. It's not an embarrassment deal. What I'm going to tell you happened to me. Uh, it could scare some of you, make you not come tomorrow night. The Holy Ghost does not go around. He's not about embarrassing when I've seen all this stuff in the past, and I felt weird. Even when I was a preacher, sitting and listening, but I just felt this weird. Man, I just don't want them around my family. I don't want that traveling preacher that the church brought in around my family. I'll be honest with you, just weird. And later, one that was doing some stuff, I won't tell you who, you know his name. He got caught on womanizing money, IRS trouble. He owed millions. The IRS has been hiding money. 
All right, weird, but it looked real. It looked real, but I felt weird. And I asked God, I asked God, I said, what did I feel? As a Lutheran coming in, I said, what did I feel? Why didn't they feel it? They were oohing and on. Oh, they were silly, but they were oohing and on. Charismatic church. It was a, uh, I'm going to be honest, it was a uh, Copeland type of church. Okay, Tulsa, Copeland type of church. I'm just, I'm just shooting straight tonight. And I'm a Pentecostal guy, and I felt weird. But I was Lutheran, I didn't want to quench the spirit. Because I knew I ain't, I ain't seen nothing all those years. So I'm tired of being in nothing, but I don't want to miss it. I said, is there a balance? Because I, I don't want to be dead crazy or crazy crazy. I want to be balanced in the middle. And the Lord said, you know what you felt that night? During the service, I said, what? He said, you felt the embarrassment of the Holy Ghost. They were so into oohing and on, following a preacher. You felt the embarrassment of the Holy Ghost. He was embarrassed. And my next point as a young Lutheran coming in, why didn't the head preacher that was going crazy about him, why didn't he see it? He said, Robbie, did you see the crowd that was there that night? Oohing and on. That preacher would give anything to have that crowd. He gave up even his discernment for the crowd. He gave up his discernment when they were hanging out of the balcony and the church was breaking the fire code. It was illegal to have that many that night. They didn't, I mean, they didn't care. It's a good problem to have. But they were being deceived like crazy. And I was a Lutheran that hadn't even read through the Bible. And I knew something was wrong. So every preacher that starts traveling started out, you know, you start out and you start out, you know, with the headache deal or whatever, and you start out, I guess he graduates you K through 12. You start operating, some of us, some of us in different things, and I'm real reverent about it, and I check, it checks me. And I'm like, no, that could be me. So I had to battle through all that and learn. Even in Walmart, at a Sonic drive-in, when they bring me a Coke, Spirit of God, I don't think everybody I pray for, I got a word for. When they line them up and they got a word for everybody, I'm leery of that. I might be wrong, but they just feel like they have to tell everybody something. I don't think everybody I pray for, I have to tell them something. But I remember when the Lord started using me in other things. Now, don't panic. He's not about embarrassment. God don't embarrass sinners. He convicts them. He did embarrass one group of people in the Bible, the mockers and scoffers that would not stop. Matter of fact, there was times he killed them. He didn't just embarrass them, he killed them. It's in the Word, Old Testament stuff. I mean, Ananias and Sapphire, that's, pretty, that's New Testament, it's pretty rough, man. Introduction of the New Testament church. Devil didn't kill them, God did. Devil didn't kill them, God did. <laughs> I'm going to get off that real quick. That's, that's weird scripture right there. I've never heard anybody fully explain that. Why he killed them just for lying about the tithe. and Because it ain't about not giving because our people would be dead everywhere. See what I'm saying? It's not just that they didn't tithe or bring a portion because our people would, all of our church people would go, they'd be dead in one service. They'd die. And all the pastors would be going around going, where's our people? They're dead. They didn't come tonight. All of them died at home. Think about it. About 80 something percent maybe. It's more to it than the tithe deal there. Right. I'm flowing, okay? No, you know what? That night I wasn't flowing. I don't know if I ever told you this or not, Brother Steve, but I was in a Pentecost church, and there was this pretty 40-something, 50-year-old woman. She's very pretty. Probably won beauty pageants in the past. Perfect looking. She's decked out, beautiful dress, immaculate hair. Took pride in her look. Took pride in a lot of ways. And she was very distracting. Because I was up here with the pastor. On here, on the front. He's about to introduce me. And she was charismatic. She would be dancing. She'd get up in the front. And her dancing was almost at times real showy and provocative. 
I mean, I didn't know if I was in a spirit-filled church service or soul train was going on or dancing with the stars because she put soul train moves in there and then she'd do some dancing with the stars. But what got me is I tried not to look at her at all. It was distracting. It's hard to worship because she, she did, you know, she'd get to flowing and then she'd turn to see who's looking at her. I knew what she's doing. I'd look and she'd be looking you know, and she'd be offering up to the Lord. Everything was about her. It was distracting. She had a bright red dress on. Never forget it. She went back and she sat with her husband and family. And the altar time came. And the Lord told me in the hotel room that day, He said, get ready and be very sensitive to quench not the spirit tonight. Because I'm going to show you something. And I want you to use ultimate wisdom with it. Eternity's at stake. I said, yes, Lord. I was 20-something years old. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, go tell the woman in the red dress... She's in adultery with the man over here in the brown suit. Brother, you better get this one right. This ain't a headache deal. This isn't a hundred dollar bill floating down deal. You can miss all that. Nobody cares. It'll show up later when you're gone. Red dress that's up here dancing is in adultery with a man sitting with his family in a brown suit. I did. I'm telling you, nervous as a my adrenaline, my I felt my blood pressure and my in my retina, my eyes was going the heartbeat. Shoo! I took a deep breath. I shook it. I did. He said, "Red dress and adultery, brown suit." I did. I went, "Okay, so that's between them." I did. I didn't want to deal with it. I want to go back to praying for the headaches. And somebody's kids are rebellious here tonight. He said, "Do you want to be used?" I said, "God." What do I do? He said, lay down the microphone. Watch the specifics of wisdom and prompting. He said, lay the mic down where it cannot be heard. Walk over to the red dress. And he said, cup your hands in her ear where nobody can hear. Whew. Ooh. One of the head people in the church. And I took the deep breath and I said, when she saw me coming toward her, she looked like, you got a word for me? I said, yes, ma'am. I got a word for you tonight. Yeah, I got a word for you. I just looked at her like, yes, ma'am. Yep. Put that ear out there and volunteered it. I said, ma'am, I've never done anything like this before. But I said, if I'm wrong, forgive me. Very humble. Not, hey, you over here in the red dress. I said, the Lord showed me you've had an affair going with a man in the brown suit. She collapsed. She wasn't dancing. She was dying to self. See, the woman had been dancing in the altar when she should have been dying to self. A lot of people dance when they ought to be dying. A lot of our families come to church and they dance in the altar together, drive 15 minutes home and feel like you left heaven and went to hell. They walk in their atmosphere by the turn of a key. And you know what? Why is your home like hell? Let me tell you Why? It was the only time you've ever been to the altar where your family's with dancing during music. The altar is a place you die in order to live. To be specific, I'm a dancer too. To be specific, the altar was never a place to dance in the Bible. It was a place when something had to die in order for something to live. From the sacrifices all the way through. Told her that, and I turned and walked, man. I just told her. I walked. She collapsed. The mascara, the tears. 
I, got, I thought I was through. I got over here and the Lord spoke to me. He said, now go to the brown suit. I said, could you send someone else? I did. I could. He's an upstanding church man, one of the big givers. I walked over to him. He had his hands up. That's what makes it hard. They learned how to do it, man. Her and him learned how to do it. There. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Laid down the mic. I cut my hands. I put my hand in his ear. I said, you've been in an affair with a woman in the red dress. I turned around walked off. He collapsed in the floor. They were like dead. Like you shot him in the heart. I walked off. Pastor came up to me. It's last night of revival. We was in his office. He was bringing me in the honorarium and a check. White envelope. Never forget it. He opened up my coat and he put it in there and padded it. He says, great offering, brother. I'm so happy and proud. Look at that and call me and tell me what you think. I'll never forget what he said. And he said, I want to ask you another question. He said, I never do this. And you don't have to tell me. I noticed the red dress and the brown suit. You walked over and laid down the mic. I just saw it. You cupped your hands. You said it. And that's the most unusual response. That wasn't slaying the spirit. They looked dead. Could you tell me what you told them? I said, Pastor, I normally, I really want to operate like that. Don't really tell anybody. But since I'm leaving town and you've asked me, I didn't come to you and you're the pastor. I said, I'm going to tell you. I told him they were in adultery together. He got mad and went crazy. He said, what? He said, no, seriously, Robbie. Seriously, what did you say? He thought I was kidding. I said, I told him this. And he went ballistic. He was crazy acting. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, you're leaving town, and you get to do that and leave. And Rob, man, that's some of my best givers. Some of my best faithful givers and church people made me mad that he said that and doubted me. And I said, hey, hey, bro. Maybe that's a reason they give so good. Maybe that's a reason they give so good. Ease their conscience. He said, Mitchell, you, you missed it, man. My God, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? That'll split my church at your exit. and I'll be left with it. And I did. I said, brother, I'm telling you. I'm telling you what he showed me. I said, Lord, I turned my head and I said, you got to get me out of this. Get me out of this. These preachers talk. They talk to one another. I no more said that. And the landline in the office rang. It's about 30 minutes after. Everybody could be home in a smaller town. They could be home in 30 minutes. The office phone rang. The pastor picked it up. And I heard the man bellowing out crying. It wasn't, Pastor, Pastor. It was, that's what it sounded like. <laughs> you couldn't even understand his words. <laughs> Pastor. <clears throat> he was a brown suit. He called and said, Pastor, I've been in adultery. I've been a slob, man. I've been in an affair with her for about a year. We come to church. At times I push the conviction aside. It makes me sick at my stomach, at myself. When I look in a mirror, when I see her dancing, I, I get sick. But I always run right back to it when we're alone. The pastor just looked and said, you are of God, aren't you? I said, man, I'm just being obedient, brother. I'm not trying to start nothing. I just got to be obedient if he's going to use me. They both separately met with a pastor, restored their marriages, and they both got right with God. They confessed, and they got right with God. He told her, he said, I want you dancing for a while. Like you take someone off the platform, I don't want you putting on that performance up here anymore. He said, you're going to sit down, you're going to listen to the word. I don't want you dancing in my altar anymore until I tell you. She said, okay, pastor. Swallow your pride. It's like yogurt. It's non-fattening. Swallow your pride and sit down and quit jumping up wanting people to see you. He said, That's the reason you're going to a bedroom, a hotel with a man in my church, tearing the families apart that's not your husband. I give you grace, but I'm not going to play with you, he said. I'm very disappointed. 
It's going to hurt when, if people find this out. I'm going to reap from it, all my hard labor and work. But I forgive you. But don't do it again. Don't do it again. I'll go to your spout. You know, I'm going to let y'all, we're going to work this out. We're going to take, that's, it. that's up to them. I, I did my job. I'm gone. I did it and I'm out. I'm in a car and I drove fast. <laughs> hey, he was in a gang or something. She was in a gang. Hey, it's real, man. I could go all night with stories like that from planes to whatever. Again, Walmart, cash registers. Oh, man, I just, it's in me. Don't be scared. He never embarrasses people that want to be free. He does not embarrass. I would never embarrass you. But we got to stop quenching the spirit. We're either Pentecost or we're not. You're not Pentecost because you clap and sing different type music. We've got to be open and flex to the manifestations as believers. We'll pray for you tonight that you're going to be more sensitive than you've ever been. And you that are here, you can break this thing wide open. When those no-shows, when they come back, when those that will never step in a foot at dark, a foot of a church, they'll never go in a church dark at night. Just something about a Sunday morning deal and they never show any other time. You've got to be the leader in the manifestations, the faithful core to help them. Or it'll dry up. The church will dry up in routine and formalism. It'll dry up. Nothing more boring than formal. Nothing more boring than formal, even if it's loud. It gets on my nerves. I'll be honest with you, I have to guard myself. Worship team, would you come tonight? Let's quench not the spirit. Don't be scared. Don't be nervous. Let's just flex, not be gullible. Let's flex our wineskin tonight and be open to the spirit of the Lord. Bow your head right now. Reverence the Lord. And just tell him how much you love him right now and reverence him. Say, Lord, we only got tonight and tomorrow night, folks. Let's be open. We're open to the Holy Ghost. We're open to the Spirit of God. Not about a man, it's about you. Tonight, my Lord, in the name of Jesus, we are sensitive to your Spirit. Love the Holy Spirit. We never want to grieve the Spirit of God. We want to be open to what you've got. You're merciful. You're powerful. We're open. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for truth. I can't create a hunger. I stir it up if it's in there, as Paul told Timothy. He told him to stir up the gift. You know what that word gift is again? Manifestation. He said, Timothy, stir up the manifestations that are in you. That's what I've tried doing tonight in this church. That manifestations, Timothy, that I laid my hands on you when you were a baby. When you're Nicey and Lois, your mother and grandmother brought you to me. I imparted something to you. Now Timothy is about to become the pastor at 18 years old at the Pentecost Church at Ephesus. And Paul writes the letter and says, stir up the gift. Stir it up that was given you 18 years ago, 20 years ago, from the laying on of my hands. It was the eternal gift. That wasn't a ritual, Timothy. I took you in my arms in your mother's house and I imparted something in you. The power of laying on of hands. Now you stir it up within you and those manifestations. Don't settle. Don't settle for the norm. Those manifestations will begin to happen. Tonight, we're not huge in number. We can do this. 
I want you to stand on your feet, everybody. I don't feel to give a certain altar call tonight. I feel this. Stand on your feet with your hands lifted. And I want you to walk down. Come on, all of us tonight. I'm going to get the oil. Pastor Steve, if you'll get me the